together. I just want to welcome you if you're in any of our rooms today, if you're in Chesterfield, in Stocksbridge, or you're in Sheffield, I want to welcome you. I want to welcome you if you're online today, and I particularly want to say a massive welcome if this is your first time at Icon Church. I want to welcome, welcome home, welcome home. So come on church, let's welcome everyone. Woo! And take our seats. Great. Well, I'm excited about today because I'm... It's the final part of a kind of mini-series that we've been doing in church called The Community of the Spirit, but it's really the first part of a series of messages that I'm going to teach over the next <clears throat> little while um, on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And uh, so today is really, I'm talking about gifts and graces, and uh, the reason I'm using the word grace, graces, is because all the gifts that God gives us are freely given. They're called charismata, and charis is the word for grace. They're free gifts. We don't have to earn them. We don't have to uh, work for them. God gives them to us, all the gifts of the Spirit. Um, but there are spiritual gifts. So whilst today is part of the series that we're closing, it's actually the first part of a series, an introduction to spiritual gifts today. Now let me tell you why it's important. I believe that every person who becomes a follower of Jesus receives spiritual gifts. I'll try that over this side because only Jeannie said yes. I believe that every person who becomes a follower of Jesus receives spiritual gifts. And um, just like when you're born, you receive natural gifts. When you're born into God's kingdom, you receive spiritual gifts. But just like when you're born naturally, you don't know what those gifts are. They develop, you grow, you learn, uh, you acquire other gifts as you grow, so too spiritually. That actually, when you become a Christian and you're born again, you don't know what those gifts are. But over time, you learn, you grow, you acquire, you develop in those things. Another reason why this is important, because God gifts those gifts to see his kingdom come and his will done on earth as it is in heaven and to see the ministry of Jesus fulfilled. You know, Jesus just started his ministry. When Luke writes in the book of Acts, he says, I, I wrote in my former book about what Jesus began to do and teach. Jesus has only just begun. He's still working today. So I want us as a community across all our campuses and online to spend time thinking about spiritual gifts. And I want to help every one of us, every one of us, to discover and recognize what our spiritual gifts might be and feel confident to develop them and eventually use them. So let's start here. 1 Peter 4 and verse 10. Each of you, there it is, every one of us, should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. God does not give us a gift to say, I've got a gift. Look at me, I've got a gift. He uses it for us to serve others. Yeah. To serve others. Okay, so there are three types of gifts. Natural gifts, these are talents, things that you're born with, aptitude. As you can see, I was born with athletic prowess. <laughs> Why are you laughing? But some people are born with a natural athletic bent, aren't they? Some people are born with uh, an aptitude for numbers. They're just born, I'm looking at a few people that are in this place, but, but just born with an aptitude for numbers, others of us have to work at numbers, don't we? I remember preaching in one church and I did this simple maths equation and the church wasn't responding. So I, I, the pastor's sister was on the front row, not you. The pastor's sister was on the front row and I said, so 27 minus 7 equals, she had no clue. It was like, I can't, Paul, I just can't do numbers. I can't even do those numbers. Never seen that before in my life. Natural gifts. Then there's acquired gifts, developed gifts, gifts that you develop in your life. This is Malcolm Gladwell's sort of, you can master some things if you put 10,000 hours uh, into something. You can just develop gifts. You can acquire certain 
gifts and get better. You can be trained to do certain things. And then there are spiritual gifts. These are gifts that are given to us by God. And they bring God's power. God's kingdom comes through these gifts. These gifts give you the most joy. They give you a sense of ease. It's a God-given ability to serve others and to do ministry and to fulfill his purpose. And in this verse, Peter teaches us that whatever gifts we have, natural, acquired and developed and spiritual, we're to use them to serve other people. But we're going to focus our attention on spiritual gifts. And I want to introduce kind of the series that's coming and at the same time finish the other series this morning. How does that sound? I can hear you in Stocksbridge. I can hear you in Sheffield. Okay. Now, let's start with tension. There's a lot of tension around spiritual gifts. A lot of tension. I'm going to tell you why. I've got about 42 reasons why there's tension. I'll just give you a few. First of all, we don't understand them. We don't always understand them. We haven't properly taught about them, and we haven't taught about the proper use of them adequately. We've just said there are spiritual gifts. You know, use, use them. Use yes, spiritual gifts. Secondly, they've been abused. Spiritual gifts can get abused. People have sometimes, when they have their own agenda, uh, can use spiritual what they call spiritual gifts, or out of our own ego, we can use spiritual gifts. Sometimes, because of our own personal insecurities, we can use what we think are spiritual gifts. And it just feels off. And whilst that's true, both of those things can be true, the correct approach to the abuse of spiritual gifts is not non-use, but proper use. Let me say that again. The correct approach to the abuse of spiritual gifts is not non-use, but proper use. Here's a few more reasons why uh, there's tension around spiritual gifts. Some people think, oh, that's the weird stuff. And let's be honest, sometimes it is the weird stuff. Because you can't put God in the box. But we live in a rational post-enlightenment world where we think everything can be um, sort of sorted out or explained if you, in a test tube. That's the world we live in. But as Christians, we believe we live in an integrated world. A world of flesh and spirit. Physical and spiritual world. And we believe that they coexist together. In other words, let's put it like this, heaven heaven and earth are meant to be one. They're not meant to be separate, so we believe they coexist and they impact each other. That there's the physical world and that's good and there's the spiritual world and that's good and they're meant to exist together. In fact, we've been told to pray for more of heaven on earth. Jesus says, pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But it can be the weird stuff. Maybe you've heard someone speaking in tongues and you wondered, what's all that about? Should have bought a Honda, but I bought a Kia instead. I know you need the interpretation. That comes later. Sometimes gifts are unregulated and uncontrolled. It's like a a free-for-all. Wild, free-for-all. Some people think church should be like that. But Paul in the New Testament spends a whole chapter in 1 Corinthians 14 on spiritual gifts saying how they should be regulated, submitted to leadership so that their use builds up the church and builds up the body of Christ and blesses people and not harms people. Not only does he write that section in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, which is about the attitude and the motive for spiritual gifts that he's just talked about in chapter 12, it's the chapter on love. It's the, it's the chapter we read at weddings, don't we? Because it's just that incredible chapter on love. But originally it's written for this is the motive for spiritual gifts. Love. Not ego, not power, not control, not my identity or insecurity, but love. Because he knows that wrong use can be damaging, but right use builds the church, builds the Christian, and 
right use comes through love because God is love. And then he moves on to 1 Corinthians 14 and says, now you need to have order in your services. They're not meant to be wild and free for all. Anybody do whatever they want. No, there's proper order. And when we talk about them more specifically in weeks to come, we'll get into some of that. Another reason there's tension around spiritual gifts, I told you I had 42, didn't I? Something like that. Is that we see spiritual gifts used in public. I'm using my spiritual gift right now. And somebody might think, well, I don't have a platform. So I see spiritual gifts used in public. How can I use my spiritual gifts? Great question. Hold it. We'll get to it in a few weeks' time. The second, another reason, the second, I'm I'm about 10 in and I've just said second. Another reason people have tension around spiritual gifts is character. Like Sister Sandpaper is prophesying all the time. But she is negative, she's critical, her character never changes. She's just a horrible person all the time. Their character never changes. And so people look at it and they think, gift, character, where's what's happening here? Great questions, great reasons. And we will get to all of it as we think about spiritual gifts in the future. But today... I want to give us an introduction. But I want to say this to start with. Natural gifts, developed gifts, acquired gifts, and spiritual gifts, we are, they're all meant to be used to serve the people of God and the kingdom of God. All the time. Sometimes, though, you know, we can assume that because we have a natural gift, that that's our spiritual gift. I'll give you an example. That can be true, by the way. But I want to give you an example. I was speaking yesterday with a pastor, and he's having a problem with a trustee. We've got great trustees in Icon Church, by the way. So I just want to say that, and uh, just want to shout, shout out to our trustees who serve the church. But this person has a really high administrative gift, which is the gift you need to be a trustee. Admin is not about writing letters, it's about organizing and being able to structure and strategize. They've got a high gift. Their job, they have got such a high gift. In fact, in their job, they can control everything. They can control millions of pounds. They can control hundreds of people in their job. So the church looks at that person and says, they'll make a great trustee. They'll be able to help us. They bring them into the church. But the spiritual gift of administration isn't to control is to serve. So if you get a trustee who suddenly comes in and thinks, oh, I know how to control millions of pounds, hundreds of people, etc., they're a nightmare if they try and take control. Because the spiritual gift of administration is to serve the vision and the leadership of the church. Good example, hey? So spiritual gifts are given by God to every believer. He decides... Because he has a plan for the ministry you should do. So let's think about some stuff. We'll get to the challenges in a few weeks. But let's think about some of that. We'll get to some more weirdness in a few weeks. So look out for that. But today I want to just give us an introduction in the next few minutes. Let's ask this question. How did Jesus do ministry? John 5 and verse 19 says this. Very truly Jesus said to them, The son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son does only. Listen to that. Jesus says, I can only do what the father does. I can't do anything myself. But isn't Jesus God? He's God, isn't he? I believe he's God. But yet he says, I can't do nothing can't do anything on my own. I have to do what the Father sees. Great question, though. Isn't Jesus God? Then what about John 14 and verse 12? Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing. In other words, you're going to do what I've been doing. But not only that, they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to me to the Father. I have to ask the question, how are we going to do greater things than Jesus 
Because isn't Jesus God? I'm not God. I don't know if you think you're God. If, if you do, come and see us afterwards. You need prayer. Uh, what's the answer? Well, the answer's found in Philippians 2 and verse 6. When it's talking about Jesus, it says this. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Eugene Peterson in the message gets this spot on when he says this. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God. He was God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. In other words, Jesus on earth did not cling to his advantages. He didn't live and operate and minister and pray and heal and deliver as God. He did it, he did ministry through spiritual gifts, through the Holy Spirit. Think about his baptism. Up to that point, 30 years of age, he's not done anything. He's the the son of a carpenter, he's become a carpenter, his father's probably died. Up to this point, he's leading the household, he's making chairs, he's doing construction, he's putting food on the table for his family because he's the oldest in the family. He's not done any miracles. He gets baptized by John in the River Jordan. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit, like a dove, comes and rests on him and a voice from heaven is heard. This is my son, whom I love, in him I'm well pleased. And then the Bible tells us that he's led by the Spirit why didn't he know himself? Because he's, he's God, isn't he? But he's not clinging to the advantages of God. So he's led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And then Luke says he returns from the wilderness after 40 days of prayer and fasting in the power of the Spirit. He's led in and he comes out in the power. Mark's gospel says that he is pushed into the wilderness. He is forced into the wilderness. Now, why did Jesus have to be pushed into the, was he reluctant? No. Why did he have to be pushed into the wilderness? Because he's learning to be filled and led by the Spirit. Because his ministry is all going to be from the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that he often withdrew to places to pray. And the reason Jesus did that was not a duty. He didn't think he had to do it as a duty. He did it because it was a delight. I've taught about that recently in the message on prayer. But he did it to hear from God and be filled with the Spirit. It was a necessity. Because he wasn't clinging to his advantages of God, he was going to live like you and I live. It was a necessity for him to hear and be filled. Are we doing okay so far? Can I hear you shouting? So here's a quote. We use spiritual gifts to serve, but we use spiritual practices, prayer, fasting, to hear and be filled. That's genius, isn't it? We use spiritual gifts to serve, but we use spiritual practices to hear and to be filled. That's what Jesus did. Now, let's just think for it. Let's segue freshen things up for a moment or two, because I know I'm teaching this morning. And think about spiritual practices. Spiritual practices are guaranteed places of encounter. Now let me say that guaranteed places of encounter. You might not sense it, know it, feel it, think it. But when you practice spiritual disciplines, you meet Jesus. He's there. You might not even feel it. You might leave church today and say, well, that was all right. But I want to tell you, where two or three are gathered in his name, he is there. He's here. He's in the atmosphere. It's a guaranteed place of encounter. The reason I come to church all the time, all the time, is not because I'm the pastor. I did it before I was a pastor. It's because it's a guaranteed place of encounter. I'm going to meet Jesus. He's going to be there. I know he's going to be there because he said... Isn't he everywhere? Yes, but this is a guaranteed place of encounter, okay? Baptism. We did last week. Eight people got baptized across Icon Church. It's a guaranteed place 
of encounter. Communion is a guaranteed place of encounter. Jesus, we do not believe, is actually in the bread and in the wine physically. He, that does not become the body and blood of Jesus. You're not eating his flesh literally or drinking his blood. But he is present and we encounter him by the Spirit when we eat and when we drink. This is good, isn't it? You want some more? Solitude, prayer, service, guaranteed place of encounter. When people, other people pray for you, when leaders pray for you. James says that if anyone is sick among you, call for the elders of the church. They will lay hands on them and the prayer of faith will save the sick. It's a guaranteed place of encounter worship I've stopped saying that I like that song don't like that song except to the worship team because <laughs> even the songs I don't like are guaranteed places of encounter because it's not about song and style and volume or anything like that and I, lo- I you know I love it pumped up Pump up the volume. I love all that. I love all that. But the most important thing about when I worship, it's a guaranteed place of encounter. And so Jesus used spiritual practices, prayer, solitude. Going, he went to the temple every time, as was his custom, the Bible says. He did that to encounter God. You see, Jesus is not just our Savior and Lord. He's our model. If you want to get that. He's not just our Savior and Lord. He's our model. He didn't just come to just shout at us and tell us how to live. He came to us and showed us how to live. And so he models how to be fully human, not clinging or using his advantages of divinity in any way. He models how to be human, how to be filled, how to be led, even how to be pushed by the Spirit into something. And he ministers to others, not using the fact that he's God, but using the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And we are called to do the same. So, there are five gift lists in the New Testament. We haven't got time to read them all, but I'm going to show you what those lists are. There are Romans 12, there's a gift list in Romans 12. There's a gift list, you can read them. Take this down, make notes. 1 Corinthians 12, there's two lists, one at the beginning, one at the end. Ephesians chapter 4, these are gift lists where the word charismata or charis are used, grace gifts, and 1 Peter 4. And they list around 21 different gifts. I'm going to read those to you. I'll make a comment on one or two, but we're going to dive into these gifts in the weeks to come. It's like a trailer, isn't it? It's just a long one. (laughs) This trailer is going to take about 20 minutes rather than two minutes. All right. So here's the gifts. Are you ready? Prophecy. Serving, which can mean helps and administration. Teaching. It's what I'm doing today using a spiritual gift, leadership, mercy, a message of wisdom, a message of knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, distinguishing between spirits or discerning spirits. Let me make a comment on this because this this one that freaks people out, what does that mean? Well, what it means is this, you know if something's coming from upstairs, downstairs or their stairs. All right? If it's coming from God, the enemy, or just the human spirit. Let me share an example with you. I was working in a church some years ago, and I'm in the office, and I'm working alongside senior pastor doing some work for the church at that time. And somebody brings an A5 envelope, and it's got my name on, one of the staff. And they come up and say, somebody's dropped this off for you. They hand me the envelope. When I take it, I know this is from downstairs. People said to me straight away, when you got hold of that envelope, all the color drained out for you. 
I said, I know, it's because I had the devil in my hand. I knew. I opened it up and we, there were accusations against the pastor that were untrue. There were accusations against me that were untrue. And we had a six-month battle with the powers of darkness and other powers as well, trying to sort that out. But Jesus is on the throne. Still here today. Still here today. So, here you go. That's what I think of your letter. There you go. (laughs) Distinguishing between spirits. Upstairs, downstairs, or your stairs. There. All right. Tongues. Here's another one. We mentioned that either. Should have bought a Honda, but I bought a Kia instead. Anybody got the interpretation? (laughs) Let me give you the interpretation, which is the next gift in the list. Should have bought a Honda, but I bought a Kia instead. This is true. I did this once. Bought a Kia instead of an Honda. Anyway, interpretation of tongues. Helps is another gift. Administration. I've mentioned that earlier um, uh, in relation to the trustee thing. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teacher, and then speaking, which is preaching and teaching. Again, I'm using that gift today. So we're going to do, in a few weeks' time, for, I told you, it's just a, just a trailer. We're going to do four weeks on these gifts. We're going to divide them into three categories and explain each gift. Maybe not all 21, but the significant gifts in each category so that you will be able to identify which spiritual gifts you have been given. Or at least you'll be able to consider, maybe that's, I've got that gift from God. And once you know that, you can pray and ask God, how can I grow in this gift? How can I develop this gift? And how can I use this gift for your glory? Also, on each of those four weeks, as I share about some of those gifts and what they look like, if you're in the meeting and you feel in any of our campuses and you feel, you know what, I think I might have that gift, we want to pray for you at the end of the service. So we want to pray for you, and we don't want you to be shy and British. We want you to come forward and say, do you know what? I think I might have the gift of. And we just want to pray. We want to pray that you will grow, that you'll develop, and that you will know how to use it in Jesus' name for his glory. So how does that sound? Good. So I want to close with this. How do I discern spiritual gifts? Okay. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 11. All of these, all of these gifts are the work of one and the same spirit and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Just as he wills. So I can't look at you and think, oh, I want that gift. I have to ask God, what gift have you got for me? What gift have you got for me? So... How do we determine? Well, the first way we determine the gifts, which are sovereignly given, they're supernatural. How do we discover them? Here's the first way, desire. Like you can join the dots maybe in your Christian life, not your life before Christ, but in your Christian life. You can start to think, why does this keep happening to me? That happened to me three years ago. That happened to me. That happened to me. That happened to me. I I prayed for someone who was sick and they got healed later on. Maybe, maybe there's a gift that God wants to give to me. You join the dots. Why does this keep happening? 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 1 says, Follow the way of love. There it is, motive. And eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. In that verse. Desire. Paul wrote again to the Corinthians earlier. He has said we, in chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit is, who is from God, so that we may understand what God has graciously given to us. So you begin to understand what gifts you have because of the desire that you have. If you have a desire 
to see people healed. Maybe God wants to use you in that gift. Maybe you have a desire to see people helped. Maybe God wants to use you in the gift of mercy. You have a desire. You join the dots. Here's the second way that you discover your spiritual gifts. Frustration. You're frustrated. You're angry that the church doesn't do more of X, whatever X is. Let me tell you, the, 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 what's happening right there is not that you are being given a moment to tell the leaders what to do, but God is stirring up a calling for you to do something. Hello? Because I've seen Christians, I mean, I've been doing this for 40 years, right? I've seen Christians get angry, frustrated. Well, we need to do this, we need to do this, we need... And then they go down the road and they just end up angry, frustrated down the road. Because they don't realize their frustration, their anger, their godly anger is a call from God to get off your rusty dusty and go and do something. I've not used that phrase for a long time. It's a call to use and develop your gift. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a call to get from a place of frustration to a place of joy, of love, of ease and passion because you're actually using the gifts that God wants to give you. God does not want you frustrated, angry and miserable. He doesn't want you as grumpy cat. Although if you've got a cat, I can understand why that you're grumpy. <laughs> All right. So that's the second way you discover. The third way is, what's the result? When you flow in your gift, the kingdom comes. People are encouraged, built up, edified. Look at these two verses from 1 Corinthians 14. So it is with you. Since you are eager for the gifts of the Spirit, try to excel in those that build up the church. Uh, try to excel. In other words, try, try and grow and develop in that gift. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. That's your job. Build the church. Build it up. Encourage it. Make it stronger. Make it larger, make it bigger, make it more powerful. Lift people's heads in the church. Everything must be done so they're built up. So let me tell you the latest stats about how the church is doing across the world. Across the world, the population is growing at around 1%. But the church is growing around the world at 2 percent oh come on I hope you're cheering up in starts with your Sheffield the world population is growing at one percent but the church is growing at two percent there are only yes come on there are only 22 nations where that's not true where the church is in is not growing across the world and I believe one of the reasons that is that we need to lean more into the way of Jesus in doing ministry. We don't need to become more weird, but we need to have proper use of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Anybody with me? Yeah. So there are different gifts. We've seen that. There's also different strengths of gift. I, th I think my personal view is some gifts are permanent, other gifts are on the job. In other words, some gifts that you've just are given to you by God. You know, like, you know, this, what I'm doing now, I could do every day. I could do every day and not burn out. I know, I know I could. Like, I could just do it every day. It's ease, I have an ease, I have a joy. I'm buzzing right now. <laughs> and it's not the carbonated water. Then there are other things I do. I think it's a permanent gift. But then there's other gifts that just come and they go. I turn up and sometimes God uses me, sometimes he doesn't. 
I believe some gifts are permanent, given to us when we're born again. Others, God uses us from time to time. Some gifts are heightened expressions of things that we're all called to do as Christians. Like we're all called to be compassionate and care for others, every Christian. But there's a gift of mercy. Like some of you just can't help helping people. You, you want to help people. But we're all called to help people. But some have a spiritual gift of mercy helping people. So let me just pause here for a second. Acts of kindness. We're all called to bring a tin of baked beans or some pasta or something. But some people, they've got the gift of mercy. They're coming in their own time. They're making up boxes. They're delivering boxes. They're paying for stuff, which we don't want them to have to do, by the way. They're paying for stuff when we've got shortages. We don't want them to have to do that because we all want to have compassion, don't we? So just bring something every week, a tin, two tins, a bag of something. And let's all do that in all our campuses. Hey, my time's gone. All right. Some gifts are just heightened anyway. So we all play. This is how we play our part in the building of the church. Loving, joyful, gift-based service. You are full of gifts. You've got natural gifts, you've got acquired and developed gifts, and you have got spiritual gifts. I want to help you. We want to help you recognize your gifts. So many people say, I've got nothing to give. Come on, you just don't know it. You, ju- you are a gift machine. I think it's coming on the screen. Maybe it's not. You are a gift machine. You want to say it to yourself. I'm a gift machine. You have been designed by God to bless others. You are a walking blessing. You are a walking blessing. Let's finish where we start. Let's pray. Come on, let's stand together. 1 Peter 4 and verse 10. Let's read it together. Let's read it loud. And... uh, in all our rooms today, let's believe for a, a new season, a fresh season, a fresh wind of spiritual gifts poured out that don't harm, that bless, that don't tear down, that build and grow. Amen? So let's read this together. After three, one, two, three. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Let's pray. Lord, my prayer as we begin this conversation is that you will take us on a journey, all of us, each of us, a journey to discover all our gifts, natural gifts, gifts that are developing, how we can use them, but spiritual gifts too that we would discover what gifts that you have given to us and that we would grow in those gifts and we would be able to use those gifts in a way that your kingdom comes and that your church is built we say your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven and everyone said amen let's worship together